all good on this front all right uh, y'all we've got some really cool papers to talk about tonight um, some of these have controversy others have maybe needing to have more experimentation to really look at and analyze and a little of everything in between cat just gave you a bandit high five nice jimbo how many cats do you have all right let's go ahead and bring on danny All right. Hi, Danny. Hey there, Blint. How you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you doing, good sir? It's going well. Yeah, had an excellent stream. Really fun discussion today. I'm excited to, uh, to continue that right now with these new uh, new papers that we've sent to each other. So nice. Yeah, yeah the yeah. the papers are they're very exciting, and I think they're a wide mix wide mix of stuff today. Definitely. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm. Uh, I'm excited about this one. Um, how is, has your stream been so far, by the way? It's been good. We actually, during the starting soon screen, we've hit the requirements for that third month of Partner Plus. Congratulations. Holy cow. Can we get some... Uh, some yeah. I got... <laughs> that... <laughs> That's one kind of celebration, I suppose. <laughs> Into the basement I go. <laughs> But yeah, it was, I, I, you know, I still don't believe it until we see that email, but I was like, whoa, I think we hit it, chat, and we got the, the upgraded, num updated numbers, and it all looks it. You 1 million percent deserve it, Belen, so I'm, I'm really happy. I knew you would get it. <laughs> Thank you. Or, or, yeah, we're, I, I haven't even been able to tell Lita yet. Oh, really? Oh, wow, she's going to be thrilled. That yeah. There's there's some yeah. dancing hype yeah. for us. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's fantastic. um fantastic. we were doing some uh some science art pieces. We had uh, a community redemption for folks. They wanted to do, have like uh we call trolls that come in smellies, right? So we wanted to have a no smellies kind of animation. And so we yeah, uh right. made a fruit fly in a gladiator outfit smelling smashing a smashing a piece of rotting fruit. You know, it's a little bit of its <laughs> biology and a little bit of a sentiment as well coming through, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Are you not entertained? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's yeah. that's been the crux of it. We chatted some science as well, getting ready for today. Uh, folks were excited about some of the the topics that I started teasing. Um, I think as nice. you know, I think on both fronts too. I think the follow up to the ichthyosaur is going to be a really neat one too. And then of course the uh, the controversial one which actually I didn't realize but when I got the the paper I opened it up on the computer and it was in a different language. Oh, it was in Italian probably. Uh, yeah, and so I was like what on earth is going and then I, I found the setting. I found the setting where I could do the English translate. I was nice. like yeah. I was like what is what is what is Danny doing here? What is Danny doing here? <laughs> well, you're you're fluent in Italian, right? Yeah, 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 yeah of course. Absolutely. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> also i love um, the uh is it an ichthyosaur behind you as well on the wall yeah right there that's uh that's my one figure that's ever been included in a science textbook before. oh cool i made that back when i was in like middle school so that's like a it's an ichthyosaur that i did in like a, a pacific northwest indigenous people style uh, a group of people that back when i was a kid um you know uh, Kwaki Udal was the name for like I guess a conglomeration of like Pacific Northwest tribes. I don't think that's the the term of art nowadays. Um, but anyway, it's that kind of like Pacific Northwest style of uh, of an ichthyosaur. So we're talking about ichthyosaurs today. I thought I'd put that up there. That's amazing. It was, that's an, it, it was included in a textbook from a thing that you did in middle I, school. I can show it to you. Yeah, let me let me find that real quick. Yeah, if, if you have a if you have here. a sec, I'd love to see that. That should be. Um, yeah, Cowan 2014, I think. History of Life. And that is... Goodness, where was it? But, um... It's included as an illustrate, Like a, a more fanciful or speculative reconstruction of an extinct animal. Uh... Yeah, where did... Oh shoot, what page is that? 
I'm paging through it right here, but it's, uh, it's in this book. Let's see. Marine reptiles. Might be toward the beginning. But, uh, yeah, so that was back when I had a, a t-shirt shop on cafepress.com when I was in middle school, and the author of this book found that, and he thought it was so neat that he wanted to include it in the textbook, and he's like, I'm sorry, I don't have the budget to, like, you know, um, <laughs> to, uh, to pay you for it, but he said, I can, I can put a link to the t-shirt shop in the text of the textbook, and so it's in there. It's now defunct. I don't think that shop still exists. It shouldn't, anyway. I'm not making money off of it anymore. That is amazing, but, uh, Danny. Like, the guy was just searching around, came across yeah. your image. There it is there, page three. <laughs> oh, look at that. Yeah, right there. That's so um, cool. Yeah, yeah. And the, uh, it, the, the artwork by Danny Andusa, used by permission. Um, yeah, yeah. Nice, and the, the, link, the link is still there for the cafe press underneath? It is. That's a little embarrassing because that doesn't exist anymore. No, that's really cool. Yeah. That's really, really cool. <laughs> that is, like, yeah. So just, I mean, thinking about it, you were in Renaissance Man before Renaissance, like, like as a middle schooler. Like, that's so cool. Like, that's. <laughs> I had yeah, I had no yeah. idea about that. You did that. That's really amazing. I think that was eighth grade that I that I created that shop, and that was one of my first designs. Was uh, was that one there? Yeah. Yeah. And you also did t-shirt printing later on too, right? Yeah, I eventually learned to cut out the middleman and just print the shirts myself rather than print them on demand through a website like that. And uh, yeah, yeah, I still do a little bit of that nowadays, printing shirts. And uh, I got to put that on my to-do list. Actually, I got to do some more before I leave for the field. It's the screen but, uh, printing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There yeah. was a, a stream you had. Cool. What was it like two years ago? Where you were yeah, uh, that screen might printing? Yeah, uh, might be up on YouTube now. I think I think Claire just put that up recently. Because um, I remember you, yeah. we had the option for pre-ordering the shirts, and I was like, "Oh my god, a handmade Danny shirt! Let's go!" <laughs> <laughs> they didn't turn out well enough for me to send them out, so I don't know. It wasn't even a pre-order; it was like a get your name on a list so that when the pre-order stage arrives, I could figure out how to charge people for them. But I didn't even get to that point. I printed a bunch of shirts and they, they didn't turn out super great. So, yeah. But maybe in the future, maybe maybe in the fall, I'll I'll do a a merch drop where I can hand print a bunch of shirts live on stream and then ship them out. But shipping gets so expensive, especially internationally. To send out one T-shirt to Australia was going to be like fifty dollars. Yeah. So uh, I mean, I, I didn't want to charge people that much to do that, you know. So it's, it's one of the reasons why I didn't go through with it. It's totally crazy, right? Like even a, a pin yeah. to Australia is like thirty dollars in shipping. That's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, so but we, it's maybe we'll do U.S. only, but I don't want to leave out all the wonderful people from around the globe. So I, I don't know. It just out, also speaks to how amazing you are that you made those shirts and you you were like, no, I don't think they're good enough for the people. Like, the, the print quality wasn't good enough, and it, it turned out that the shirts weren't like. Some of them were actually like almost defective, or like they had threads coming off in places. It just. I didn't feel good about, you know, the quality there, putting my name on them. So, just nixed the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. And. Yeah. But before we start, we do have a question about your YouTube. Let me go ahead and grab it, unless if Claire oh, okay. is still here, I know Claire has it on speed dial, but I can go ahead and grab oh, yeah. it too. Yeah. There's been a lot of stuff put up, Coffee Rocks, um, on Danny's field work. Oh, there we go. Smike's got it. Nice. Yeah. And we'll pin that message as well. There's a lot of good stuff there. There's old streams. Oh, There's... um. Again, I think, I mean, some of the coolest stuff, too, is, like, the field work. And there was even, uh, Danny was showing Coffee Rock's uh, streams from when him and Lardy were going museum visiting and showing the yep. museums on stream. And it was wild as I remembered those streams <laughs> that I was watching from the lab. Like, I had my phone in my pocket with, like, a earbud, and I'd look at, look at the stuff they're showing. Because I even remember, Danny, there was, like, when you, there was, like, a raid that came in, like, from a new person. Uh -huh. And so it would be... You and Lardy would introduce yourselves, and you know Lardy would come on too. And she's like, "Hi, I'm Lardy. I do the cooking stream." And like, I as you were playing it, I'm like, "I remember this scene like exactly how it went down." 
That's awesome. I haven't even rewatched these. Like I'm, I'm gonna be doing that a little bit of that this weekend. Like going back and rewatching some of these, and it's it's you know wild to have been there and streamed it and then see it on screen and like oh yeah I remember this I remember that I remember what I was thinking in that particular moment. Um, I remember it's it. so cool that you've got like you were able to share in that experience and you've got your own oh yeah associations that we it's, to do, yeah. And I I even remember when y'all were in San Diego and you went to some park. And like the park people Los came Angeles. up to you. Oh, it was L.A. And they came up to yeah. you all right, and you're like, you can't, you can't be filming here, and you have to be like, actually. <laughs> oh yeah, what? Shoot, when was that? That might not have been Los Angeles. I forget. Um, oh, La Brea. Yeah. Claire, Claire knows. Claire remembers. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't La Brea. Yeah, in Los Angeles. <laughs> I um, remember. I was like, oh no, no, don't, don't get arrested. No, that's that's public property. Like, it, it's it's kind of funny sometimes how like security guards don't actually know what they're talking about <laughs> um but as long as you're like not obnoxious then not causing any problems usually they just leave you be but uh but yeah yeah you know charlie's dragons look i i can't remember the last time that i missed this well actually no i did miss the stream last week because the munchkin was in the er but beyond that right like good reason yeah. uh paleo ken was mentioning to me the other day he's like yeah i was looking through these old youtubes and you're like from 2021 and two, like I keep seeing you, and it was like before you ever streamed. I was like, yeah, oh yeah. Though I've, I when I tell you that he's the reason why we're on Twitch. I'm not just, I'm not just. I had to tell Danny too. I'm like, I'm not blowing smoke. He really is the, the reason we do this. And um, yeah, you inspired a whole generation of scientists to be on this platform. So, I, I appreciate you saying that, boy. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, no. But yeah, y'all, check out the YouTube page. It is pinned to the top of the chat. Uh, and enjoy. There's a lot, a lot of good content there. Museum hopping, um, IRL field work, and just the general streams as well. Like, there's a lot of learning that could be had just listening to the passive questions that people ask. And you start to see even patterns of what people are really into in terms of questions. And you'll start being like the, the regulars where you'll already know some of the questions that are starting up. And like... You know, like, why did the dinosaurs go extinct? Or the oxygen levels and, like, all the common ones where there's commands where you're like, oh, I know all this stuff now. And it's it's really cool, like, how much you can actually learn, like, on these streams. They're not just empty nonsense. They're always, you're always learning. And even if you're just having one ear on it, like, you're going to learn a lot. And it's one of my favorite streams, Danny. I, I appreciate you saying that. Holy God. That's what I'm striving for, so it's, it's good to know that a certain extent that's working so thank you always yeah. shall we get started on some science yeah let's do it which uh which of your two papers were you most excited about discussing <sighs> uh, you know me oh, i'm gonna jump on the yeah, the yeah. molecular side of things is the okay the coal memory uh, one. but i'm happy you, you you lead the way sir where where should we start tonight i thought the bats one was was something that there was some nice confluence between our, our two fields there. I I so that's the thing that I was thinking too, as especially like yep. with this the controversy quote unquote paper that you sent. Uh, that's not yeah. actually controversy, but it's like you said maybe kicked up a little bit. I think that has a lot of good overlap. Oh, you want to start off with the the theropod ontogeny one? Well, I think that one plus bats. There's some. Yeah overlap all right, all right. there in the that definition of species if you wanted to start there yeah, which, yeah. which one should we start with what do you think would make most sense why don't we start off with the bats one okay um because i'm not sure how discussion for the other one how long that's going to take so let's at least get through the bats one first because i feel like that was fairly straightforward but really cool at the same time uh, yeah it was i guess there's there's good in having some straightforward stuff too and it's yeah. Like, done pretty cleanly, too. So, it's, uh, here is the paper, y'all. And everyone's interested. We do post the papers on the Discord ahead of time. But here is the first paper. And it is open access. Actually, in the journal Evolution, which is usually not open access. But it's nice to see that it is open access. They must have paid the premium fee on top of it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it is entitled uh, Parallel Evolution in an Island Island Archipelago revealed by genomic sequencing of a uh, leaf-nosed bat. Um, and the premise of this, y'all, is a little bit rooted in what is a species. 
And so, take these two images. I'm going to drop it in here if it's going to come in. Let's see. Comparing two different baths. And the only thing that is changing here is the size of these animals. And so how why we thought this was really cool to talk about is that's a little bit on how dinosaur bones are also looked at, right? So like how are like like early young di right? It was the whole controversy with Nano Tyrannus, right, Danny? Sure. Is it is it different from T Rex, Tyrannosaurus Rex, because it's smaller and more gracile and it's got a different shaped skull? Is it actually a different species or is it just a young T Rex? And that's like an ongoing controversy in dinosaur paleontology. Um, talking about ontogeny like that, like the life history of these individual animals, how they change as they grow and develop. And uh, this is, is almost kind of the opposite, where it's like they're, they were thought to be two different species for a long time, and they they're, it looks like they're on their way to becoming different species, even though genetically they're extremely similar. That was kind of my, you know, one of the things I thought was most interesting about this paper. Is yeah. These bats, like, morphologically they're very similar, but they're, like, wildly different sizes. There's two different populations that live in the same place. So they're what we call sympatric species. They're in the same habitat. They, like, they live cheek by jowl with each other. But... They seem to be splitting, in the process of splitting into two different species. Because they don't breed with one another, they have different vocalizations, different habits. Uh, it's like one species in the process of splitting into two. And uh, there's a really neat map in the paper too, which I, I, I appreciated that they went to this level to show where the overlap is. Uh -huh. So for example, right here's the map that Danny was talking about where we're kind of looking at different types of overlap and you're actually having different types of overlap where, actually we'll go ahead and open up the PDF. It's probably an easier view. Here we go. Where there's some instances on the island, on these set of islands where there's, you know, one spe one only one of the species and then some islands have multiple of these species. And again, the only real difference that we're seeing phys physically is a size difference. There is big and small. And then there's also differences in their pitch of echolocation. And that was kind of what they were going for. And I, th I think, Danny, in my impression of the paper is they started off with the hypothesis that these are, in fact, two different species. And they were yep. just kind of... Yeah. Like, these are two different species, but let's kind of solidify the argument as to, like, why they are. And I think the surprise came when they started doing the genetic sequencing. Yep, and looking at, at these different bats from across different islands, too, like, the impression that I got is that they they thought that, like, oh, well, these are definitely different species of bats, um, and they must be distantly related to each other. It's probably all the big bats are related to all the big bats, and the small bats are related to the small bats. But on these different islands, you've got big bats and small bats on each island, and they're more closely related to each other than they are to bats on other islands, it seems like. So it's like you've got an ancestral population of bats spread throughout these different islands. And then those populations, each on these islands, kind of split into two. Where you've got a big bat species and a small bat species that are evolving from the same ancestral population. And they're more closely related to each other than they are to the bats on the other islands, which is really wild. Yeah. I think another big reason why this is a such an interesting paper is that there hasn't really been evidence like where we can study this live, right? Especially yeah. not in something as complicated as a mammal. And so it's, there's something unique about these islands. And it kind of brings into like, I think I would be, it would be interesting to get Volcano Doc's take on this of like when these islands formed and then yep. given the age of the island, maybe that somehow connects to the likelihood that something's able to diversify and actually become a brand new species on these islands. Like, how much geological time are we actually dealing with? What does that mean yeah. in terms of how long these animals can survive? Like, like are what are we early? Are we later in the time scale? Like, where exactly are we I, falling in? I would get based on what I know about the Solomon Islands and the rest of Oceania, like that. This would be pretty recent splits uh, because sea level rose at the end of the last ice age. The ice melts. 
and then sea levels rise. And so this used to be like continuous land throughout big parts of this. There would have been land bridges. Yeah. And so bats would have more easily been able to move from one place to another. And then when the sea levels rise, it's like, oh shoot, they're kind of cut off. Bats will occasionally make large journeys over ocean water like that. That's how bats got to Hawaii or New Zealand, for instance. But it's like, it's like a once in a several million years kind of freak event. It doesn't happen often. Um, which is why there aren't tons of bat species on super distant islands um, around the world because, like, yeah, it doesn't happen very often. So, it also, I think that's it, probably part of it. it was, yeah, yeah I, I mean, it also is kind of highlighted by the fact that some of these islands only have one of these species versus both, yeah. right? Like, if they were just migrating, this isn't, like, a huge land mass to cross in terms of water, and it doesn't really uh -huh. seem like they're really jumping around for that reason, which I think is another interesting, yeah. like, a side point. Yep. And, and to kind of set the stage for everybody watching geographically, this is the Solomon Island chain, so this is part of Oceania. This is, like, kind of north east of Australia. Um, and the island of Guadalcanal, if we have any World War II buffs in chat, Guadalcanal is one of the islands here in the Solomons. Uh, really important engagement in uh, the Pacific War World War II. And, uh, Charlie's Dragons is an interesting point. So different populations separately splitting into big and small populations, not one overarching split between big and small. So Charlie's, if you if you thought it, if it was going to be just a split in big and small, you'd probably be sitting seeing intermediates too. Right, this like middle stage. And actually, Hanny, that's getting to your question too of, you know, are they still interbreeding? And we're not seeing these intermediate sized animals. And actually, there, no. Danny, I, I was looking at the research lab, and it turns out there is an earlier paper where they actually look at the reproductive parts of wow. these different bat species. And they say, based on the reproductive parts, you can't really tell them apart. Interesting. So That's, it's not like they're physically incapable of interbreeding. They've got the equipment where they could do that. They're just not doing that because they're, they've become so different in their habits, I guess, where they're just not hanging out together anymore. Yeah. Like, or they're not, they don't see each other as potential partners anymore because they've diverged in these different areas. Like, they're probably eating different prey. I think that was one of the hypotheses in here. Yeah, which is, um, it, it's weird yeah. that they didn't, the hypo, well, good, we'll get to the hypotheses chat because there was a question earlier about why they may have split. They didn't actually test those. I feel like they would have been easier to test. Maybe that's going to be a follow up paper or I don't know, but, um, and also figuring out why they split in the first place, that could be tricky. We talked about that today on my stream, like, why do certain things happen in evolution? What's the story behind it? That's real tough to figure out sometimes. We just know that it happens, and we can try and come up with an explanation, but, like, is that really why, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, the, you know, one hypothesis, chat to get it, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but diet. Like, of what these animals were eating. And that could al also be why one grew bigger, is to feel a niche, that there was a selection pressure. There was a prey item that wasn't being eaten by anything else. Maybe the prey that the bats were generally going after were hard to get. They were maybe low in numbers. And so maybe they, you know, the changes in echolocation frequency and pitch made them more likely to go after bigger prey. And if they got bigger, they are more successful. But, you know, it's, it is a... a guess of a hypothesis and maybe if you could prove what they ate today you'd be more likely to to demonstrate this but actually they didn't go and tell us what the diets are yeah i I'm, that might be something they don't really know <laughs> you i think a lot of people in chat would be surprised to learn that like for so many different creatures that we have around today different animals we don't really understand their diets or their habits you know Fossil organisms are a different beast entirely because it's like we can't observe them. But for so many creatures around today that we can directly observe in the wild, nobody's done that yet for so many of these critters. And we just don't know what they're doing. Like, what are they eating? Well, what are their habits? We don't know. Yeah. It's really hard, right, to, like, wrap your head around why we don't know these fundamental things about yep. things that are alive. And it's not even like you need a molecular toolkit to do it. You just need a nope. pair of eyes to yeah. watch. And, and in, it's... in some of these cases, there might be, like, uh, there might be indigenous knowledge there. There might be people who have been living in these areas for hundreds or thousands of years that might know this like the back of their hand. They're like, oh, yeah, well, those guys eat moths, and those guys eat crickets or whatever. 
but that's not made its way into the scientific literature yet. Um, it's not been like documented in the scientific literature, and it's. I think for a lot of these things, we're still kind of at the very beginning of our understanding, which in a way is exciting. I mean, there's so much out there that yet to be learned, and people can build their whole careers just doing basic observations. Of these things. Especially something like this, where it's no one's ever yeah. looked at mammals, so you're they're on the cutting edge of looking at each of these elements. So we'll go over the genetics in, in just a sec of like what they looked at. Uh, Atlas Brood yeah. asks a question out of both of us, Danny. What do you guys think of the sort of discourses interviews that Isaac Asimov had in the 80s? There was very specific quality and eloquence to them that I find hard nowadays, though the passion is apparent in your stream and certainly Danny's. I, uh... I want to say I, I saw an interview with him. I want to say he was talking to a scientist about something. I can't remember what it was. But, um... Yeah, I don't know. I... I kind of wonder whether there's really room for that in a modern media landscape. Like, on broadcast television to have a scientist just, like, chatting about things. Um... I feel like modern media has kind of moved away from that, unfortunately. I don't know. What, what do you think, Bullard? I think it doesn't sell easily Yeah. because it's not clickbait. Yeah. Honestly, I think, unfortunately, that's what it comes down to is that it's not clickbait. But I think there is a market for it because look at Danny's stream, right? Look at yours, Bullard. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And and so, I, yeah, there is an absolutely an appetite for it. Like, we chat science together and, like, on the collab streams and also on our own. And there are people that show up and ask questions and become engaged. And I think that kind of further drives our passion for this. And so I think there is a market for it. It's just not going to be on the mainstream media because it, it's not yeah. – you have to invest time into it. You have to look for people. You have to even invest time in a cultural change where it's – Scientists, yeah. I, th I think what happened, and you know, I may or may not be right on this, but my perception is that there is a generation of scientists that regularly chatted with people and felt like it was yep. totally acceptable to go out in the public and advocate for what you work on or just even sharing your knowledge with people. And then I think yeah. there was a shift to where the secrecy took over. You were worried about someone else taking your work and so you didn't want to be open and honest about what you do and yeah. then it kind of bled into everywhere else under the sun too where it's like you just don't want to talk yeah. to people and even my last boss her mentality was well the public is too stupid to understand what I have to say so I'm not even going to bother they should just believe me yeah that kind of like almost a authoritarian kind of viewpoint and I, I had a uh, I talked about this in a the talk that I did for the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology back in October, talking about um, the Cold War in the U.S. and how that kind of led to scientists becoming more withdrawn from the general public. Um, did, did we talk about this before, Belinda? I think, well, I've definitely heard it on your stream. I don't know if we've mentioned it here. Yeah. The, the, the long and short of it is... Um, Prior to the 1950s, scientists used to have to go out and talk to the general public and talk about how cool their research is and give public talks. And during this time, some of the most famous people on the planet were scientists, people like Albert Einstein, you know, celebrities, um, people like Edwin Hubble, for whom the Hubble telescope was named. He was one of the most famous people in the world. And like Hollywood celebrities would come visit him at his observatory and they'd line up to look through the telescope have all kinds of lavish parties and stuff like science was cool but then in 1957 i think was sputnik one um the soviets put a satellite up into space and then uh the american military brass they were terrified of this and it's like holy cow the russians are beating us at science um we need to put more funding into uh into science in the United States and really increase science education in elementary schools and high schools and everything else. But during that time, all of this money was pouring into science through the military industrial complex and scientists were discouraged from going out and talking to the public. So there were like multiple generations of scientists who basically were encouraged to just stay in their laboratories and not talk to regular folks. Don't, don't publicize your research. 
don't talk about why it's important. Just sit there and work in the laboratory. We'll feed you this money and just, you know, become this class of, of intellectually cloistered monks, almost. And we're still kind of in that today. I think the legacy of that continues to the present, except also we've lost most of the Cold War funding, too. So we don't have the money, and we don't have the real ability to talk to the public anymore. Like, we're still lagging behind there. Um, so that's... Uh, that's the long and short of it. There. Hopefully that wasn't too... Hopefully there's more on the short side than the long. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's yeah. definitely maintained. It would be great if it wasn't. I think the yeah. way you've always said and the way we advocate here too, it's like it's almost the responsibility of scientists to do that advocacy. Not even not yeah. from a funding perspective, none of that. Just like you're on the front lines of knowledge and finding knowledge. No one yeah. else is doing that. Like You are in a place of extreme privilege. Absolutely. Like, we get to, as scientists, we get to spend our days learning about the way the world works. Like, we're, we're living the dream to a certain extent. As difficult as it can be, as, as, as elusive as the funding can be sometimes, as aggravating as academia can be, we're, we are in a place of tremendous privilege. And scientists tend to be people who are driven by passion. Naturally, we should want to share that passion with others. And that's what drives me to science outreach talk to folks about science five days a week here and yeah but it, it's it's really depressing and distressing how much that is just beaten out of of other scientists in our fields like this discouraging people from doing outreach discouraging scientists from reaching out to the public and, and talking about their work um it's not good for anybody and but that's that's the system that we that we live under that's kind of what modern academia is like and it, it also goes into like the intersection points between fields too of like encouraging or disc like you don't want to talk like yeah. that's one thing in ecology actually ecologists tend uh, not to talk to molecular biologists because really? of uh, funding differences danny because like if i show you a cool phenomena uh -huh. you're just gonna grab my experimental model sequence it figure out the molecule and you're going to get the big paper and then i'm i don't need i'm not going to get funding anymore because i can't compete uh, uh, that's that's uh that's awful and it, it kind of goes into i don't know if it was the same documentary that we peeked at today with richard Feynman. richard Feynman it might have been a different Feynman interview thing but he was talking about how uh he was asked to become part of the the National Academy of Sciences or something like that. I think it was the, the NIS um, back in the day. And he's like, I don't want to be part of this. He's like, this is what it, I don't I don't care about honors and, and, you know, status and stuff like that. He's like, I do science for the sake of science, for the joy of like finding out new things and like communicating that to people. He's like, you know, sometimes these organizations like they get really clicky and it'd be like, oh, you know, we physicists need to stick together and keep the chemists out, you know. They're thinking about inducting a new chemist into the, the society. And, but, you know, we physicists got to stick together make sure that doesn't happen. Like, yeah. I, luckily, I don't feel like we have too much of that in paleontology. So that's that's kind of distressing to hear that there's, like, a an unproductive rivalry between ecologists and molecular biologists. Oh, yeah. Um, I, mean, I didn't we, know that. That's uh, the, the most prevalent example that I can think of was... Before my time in ant genetics, there was a gentleman who was an expert in Arizona on the Indian jumping ant, and he was, you know, like, working out the ecology and doing what he could, like, with some imaging, but there really wasn't, you know, it was all NSF funding. And then people yeah. were like, oh, this is really cool because it's a, an ant that can transition between being a queen and being a worker, and that's, like, there's some kind of epigenetics going on there. Let's do a collaboration. And so the collaboration ended in them getting a big collaborative grant right wow. which is oh this is great but then that yeah. guy was kicked out and the two molecular scientists ponied up and they were like we're just going to continue it on our own and then wasn't included for any subsequent studies that's pretty scummy yeah. and it's and you know you can't as and as a lab that has nsf funding which for those in chat that's like two hundred thousand dollars which you know it might seem like it's a huge amount but as soon as you start paying salary and uh, you know benefits you're, it, and the percentage the university takes off you're almost done 
versus if you have a lab with five RO1s, which is $5 million over the course of five years, you know, you have five of them in one, like, you're not going to compete. And so that's, that was essentially yeah. what it was. Like the gentleman who was trying to get papers, you know, in these big journals never was getting them. This collab led to a cell paper and then other big papers to the molecular people, but then he was just kind of thrown by the wayside. And they even were like, well, we offered to send, so, to teach him how to do what we know. You know, like this whole like ivory tower. But the, the problem is like, even if you teach someone how to do um, like sequencing, mm -hmm. if you don't have a sequencer <laughs> or this really expensive right, equipment, yeah. like it's, it doesn't matter. Like it's, uh -huh. yeah. Anywho, uh, there was a, a further question about if we had a, any interest in doing a multi-panel, like discipline panel. We actually did, Atlas. Uh, we had on Danny's stream a few months ago, four of us came together. Um, Volcano Doc, Paleontologizing, lovely Danny here, us, and Nerdwino came together on a stream. And we talked uh, science and we're taking questions from the community. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, yeah. Yeah, we should do that again sometime. Um, it might be after I get back from the field. Uh, or you could do it without me <laughs> while I'm busy. But yeah, it'd be cool to have more stuff like that in the science community here on, on Twitch. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, back, getting back to the paper, uh, we did yeah. look at, um, as we were chatting about like these bats and they're on these different islands... Some of the cool stuff here was, again, the sequencing element. And this gets to the whole point of what is um, the threshold of what is its species, right? Which was, which was uh, not really identified because they said, you know, everything is super close related. Uh -huh. But we still think they're different species. Right. So how does one even think of, think of that, right? And I think this is like an issue in your field too and that's not even with with genetic evidence that's just like on the the structural just component morphology. right and like what exactly that means yeah yeah I, it that's the thing is that species are on us on one level they're they're kind of a human construct we're like having to put those lines between different species it's kind of an arbitrary subjective thing um and as you well know, Belen, uh, other people in chat might not be as as familiar with this idea, but like species change over time, and they split into different species, and sometimes they come back and rehybridize, and like things get messy. It's complicated and interesting, fascinating, but uh, you know, living things don't like to fit into those neat little boxes sometimes that we as human beings try and put them into. And so, if you're seeing a species that's in the process of splitting, um, you, uh, you know, you're gonna have some gray areas there. Yeah. Yeah, and it's I, I think it's even more complicated when the researchers are trying to bring together a definition and trying to demonstrate to us that these in fact are two different species based on what, you know, we've talked about and we've chatted about yeah. and then all of a sudden it's like but they're genetically really similar but we still think they're different and this always gets to like when we talk about the new species of the week each week what exactly defines a new species in terms of like thresholding like what is the threshold right. not on a physical level but on a molecular level where creatures are different and unfortunately that is that is not straightforward yeah there, there really is no like hard and fast definition of where one species like at what point things become two different species it's like because everything is, you know, they're all offspring of other creatures. They are the, the children of parents. So it's like, at what point does the offspring become a different species from its parents? It's like, you can't really draw a line there when you've got enough data points. It's like, it, it just becomes a gray area. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Claire, would you, Claire, if you have the link handy, would you mind posting the Amazon wish list? I know what chat was asking. For some reason, I can't find my my link here. Would you mind, Claire, if you have it available to help Danny on the field excursions? 
Y'all would we are, not mind. We are swiftly running out of items on the wish list. It's been amazing. Um, Ethan keeps having to find other things to put on there because they just. I I, I know. Last week we had said yeah. that you had almost near like everything was gone. Um, I know. Uh, Dakum was yeah, asking, had and to add more things. yeah, and a couple of other people. I'm so sorry, Dan. I usually have it like ready to go in one of my tabs. No, and... no worries. No worries at all. So um, I was like searching honestly, through. Like, don't. Don't worry about it. I can find it if you want, but it's not. No, like... we got, we got it. Lovely. The lovely Claire coming in clutch. I'll go ahead and pin it so we have it for the entirety of the stream here. I appreciate that. Wait, can I not pin it? <laughs> All right, Claire, hold on. Claire, this is not a commentary on you. I am reposting it because oh no, there we go. So Mike's got it. I was it was not letting me pin because this is a uh, sometimes the pinning doesn't work for some reason, but now it did. Thank you. Thank you, Spikes. Um, oh, and DinoWolf had a really good question. They say, I really want to study this. If I were to study this, what subjects should I study? Um, biology. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Evolutionary biology. Phylogenetics. Um, yeah, this is really fascinating stuff, and there's a lot of really cool work going on. If you're interested in, like, how species, uh, how new species emerge, how they split then uh, this is like a, an ongoing subject of active research within the field of biology. There's uh, a bunch of different ways that you can study this too, uh, whether it's through field work, through morphology, through you know genetics. Um, yeah, this is a, a really cool kind of problem you can attack from a bunch of different angles. And I think it's easy. It depends what flavor of work you want to do. There are some... Yeah. Um, phylogeneticists, like, if you want to get into the field and do work where you're testing these new species and looking at them, that's going to be different from other phylogeneticists that are just, like, sure. more um, bioinformatics. Um, yeah. Because that's... Like, we had one in at Dartmouth that was primarily more on the bioinformatics side of things, and it was, like, very little field work, and it was a lot of, like, comparing and contrasting data sets from others and so if you want to be like more hands-on it's uh -huh. it's not that you can't do the the phylogenetic side of things you just have to be very careful in what lab you join so make sure to ask questions when joining Definitely. a lab so you know what training you're getting i have some colleagues who work on um stickleback fishes um and their speciation and their like their rapid evolution when they enter new habitats and stuff and they do a lot of like capturing these fishes measuring them so like measuring the lengths of their spines and stuff taking a bunch of photos and then maybe taking a little genetic sample and then releasing them um and so they're doing a lot of hands-on field work like that but they're also doing sequencing they're also doing phylogenetic stuff making trees making you know family trees for these fishes and that's really cool too to be able to like watch evolution happen in real time and work with fish if you like fish. so there's a, a lot of different ways that you can work on on speciation and like population dynamics and stuff like that yeah and now with like CRISPR gene engineering there's even more animals that you can work with and it's like those are constantly yeah. increasing I will say it's never as easy as the protocols make it out to be that we can have any kind of new animal because like it, it looks like it on paper stay lifted yeah. that you can do CRISPR on anything and in theory you can I'm gonna have to uh -huh. science the out of this but <laughs> it is it is not easy because you have to adapt every single protocol to the animal that you're working in including when you inject how you inject how much you inject and because you need to hit all those cells and not just any cells but the reproductive cells and they can be passed on to yep. the next generation like it is extremely complicated and i've worked with for professors who are like why isn't this done yet like after a week it's because it's it's not straightforward it's not easy Yeah, and don't go into biology if you like nice, neat, simple, like, mathematical, you know, uh, problems and answers and stuff. Biology is, is messy and complicated and exciting like that, I, I think. Um, yeah, that's the sort of thing that, that's how my brain works, so I'm, I'm, you know, happy to be on kind of the biological side of the sciences, for sure. I think the puzzles are, are the fun part. Yeah, and actually, uh, yeah. speaking of puzzles, Volcano Doc is here in the chat now. Uh, ah, Volcano Doc. 
Melissa, how you doing? It's good to see you. Doc, we were talking about this new uh, speciation event that's happening on uh, off the coast of Australia, and there's all these little islands that have formed. They call the Sol the Solomon Islands, and there's different so uh, different species of bats, and they essentially look identical to one another, except one's big and one's small. They've been suspected to be different species, but then they actually did some sequencing here, and they're like, oh, these are actually much closer than we thought. We're just going based on size to delineate different species, but it turns out it's not that simple. There are some molecular differences. Technology. What is that all about? Using technology, at least. Is it good, or is it whack? <laughs> Ali G came out and he helped us. Um, but so because these are so different, you know, in terms of the physical appearance, it was maybe hypothesized that they'd be diff more different on the molecular level. But both the mitochondrial uh, components as well as the nuclear components are quite similar. It gets into the argument of when you threshold them as different species and when they're just like close relatives. It is, they looked at anatomy and suggested that the animals could interbreed although they've never shown an interbreeding event to take place. Um, they've right. even shown that they live together in similar caves, which is also kind of interesting. And the only hypothesis we have is maybe what's driving this is food resources. But the question of Volcano Doc, we were just chatting about, and kind of, you know, it'd be interesting to have your take on it too, is when we have this island chain, as they're being created how that might be influencing this, these speciation events. And it's a little bit, uh, Melissa and I had this crossover stream a couple of weeks ago. We were actually talking about something like this happening uh, in real time with a uh, recent volcanic activity and talking about how there could be bacterial speciation as well that took place, similar to island, island forming and island loss as well. So we were just talking Volcano Doc and uh, you know, highlighting that you'd be the one to ask about that kind of question. Is there active volcanism in the Solomon Islands chain? Um, I don't I'm not think sure if there is. I don't think currently, no. But just like uh, in general, yeah. like how past island formation could have gotten to this level. Oh, and they are all active. All Canadox says yes, they are active. Oh, very cool. Very there we cool. go. I was not aware of that. If you get a significant enough eruption, you decimate everything on the island, but then uh, things could come over from the closest island. So maybe maybe that's what happened on some of these. I'm again just shooting from the hip here, but if there's an island with instead of having the two mixed populations, if there's only a singular one, you may wonder if yep. something like that happened. Like it was cleared and then someone else could go in and colonize it. Maybe it was one of these different size bats. Huh. Yeah, the the classic example would be like a bat you know, a small population of a bat shows up on this island, um, and then maybe they're like medium size, and then that that parent population splits into two daughter populations, where you get larger bats and smaller bats, because like the medium size isn't really going to excel. Like maybe there's two different size classes of prey, and so you get a split like that. But I don't know. That's again like the classic textbook example of uh, what we call sympatric speciation, um, speciation in the same geographical space with no no geographical boundaries between um but I, I don't know it could be that like maybe all of them started off smaller or all of them started off bigger or something i, I don't know how you'd go about testing volcano doc says there's eight active volcanoes on the chain bats could fly away but oh. everything that they feed on would likely be severely bottlenecked yeah yeah um yeah and shoot if there's if they're inhaling dust or volcanic glass or something um, I don't know if bats would be as vulnerable as birds to that kind of thing, but it can't be good for them. And the yeah. prey, too, because if they're feeding on something else, it's oh, yeah. going to be cycling further, yeah. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Volcano Doc. That's a really cool insight of it, yeah, because it, it definitely changes the viewpoint of how what might have been driving the speciation as well. Not just differences yeah. in food sources, but maybe the dip well, maybe it is differences in food sources that are driven by these natural events. Which I think is really cool. Thank you, Volcano Doc. But yeah, here are the different bats, y'all. We kind of highlighted this image earlier in the stream. And just highlighting that there's the two different sizes. And they're not finding intermediates. Uh, which I think is really interesting. It's just very different species and no hybridization happening. Uh, they did some phylogenetics. And again, what I thought was interesting is that 
when they did the genetics, there is this partially annoying trick that you can do called PCA, this principal component analysis. I <laughs> I say partially annoying because I really I don't enjoy I don't I don't enjoy this approach because essentially it's clustering things. See, Melkanodoc also hates PCA. Yeah. Um, but it's clustering well, what things. What does the C stand for? If if the P is partially and the A is annoying, what's the C? <laughs> it is the uh, the principal component analysis. Essentially, it's <laughs> trying to measure what factors are causing variance, right? So it's yep. yeah. If you have these this X Y, you can actually plot like this. This axis ex is explains X percentage of variance. And this axis explains this other percentage of variance, and you put the two together, that makes up the majority of the variance that you observe in the data set. And if things yeah. cluster together, so different species here end up in different points, right? Molly Sox, thank you for the biddy. Thank you very much. Um, if they cluster separately based on species, then you've identified something that explains variance in these animals. And if they have everything right. overlapped, and there's no, they're not being parsed out based on what the variance is explained by, then you know you're not having clean data or what you're actually looking for isn't necessarily real. Global yeah. Evil Bunny, thank you for the follow, welcome in. <laughs> and so, I mean, on this PCA, they do everything, all the species cluster separately. And this is based on looking at um, genetic sequencing and mitochondrial sequencing. So it's like based on the genetics, they are in fact different. Um, so I, you know, I, it is one of those things where I'm like, I don't especially enjoy PCA, but it is something that you can visit visibly, visibly see the differences on on the graph. Yeah. yeah. Um. And then Chad, I mean, they just they kept doing a bunch of different phylogenetic analyses, looking at some of these differences in the animals. And then really the interesting part I found was the, the final hypotheses as to why we're having these uh, huge differences in size. So it's, um, let me see, first hypothesis um, pivots on that there are differences between and within these creatures um, in body size, echolocation frequency, and hypothesizing that there's optimal prey selection that exists meaning bats with larger body sizes call it lower frequencies and detect larger prey is why this evolved. Um, the second hypothesis is that the larger body size would be adaptive if it enabled a dietary switch from insectivory to carnivory. So both of those, right, are dependent on diet. And that's why I, at the end of the paper I was left like, I think this is so cool that I would really like to know which of these hypotheses. And like, obviously, like as Danny pointed out, chat, we we cannot confirm. There is no way to confirm something this difficult to really get at. But maybe well, I mean, you could figure out how. But like, they didn't have the resources or the wherewithal to do that at the time. Well, I guess like you couldn't figure out what was the evolutionary pressure. You could just guess today this is their diet. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think we even have a good understanding of what they're eating nowadays, do we? Like, I don't think they no. have that. So, yeah, like, that would be a good first step in trying to figure this out. But, yeah, yeah. And th that's the catch. Like, we, we might know and be able to figure out what they eat. And I think yeah. that could give some leaning as to what the hypothesis, which one might be more correct. But I can see a stepwise something as well, right? Like, when they're... We don't see inbreeding or interbreeding now in intermediates, but maybe earlier there were, and they moved from smaller insects to bigger insects, and then you had further selection to go to to meet carnivory. Like you could see a, a stepwise jump of that. Like they don't, the I don't see these two hypotheses as being mutually exclusive. Sure. Yeah. Um, so even if we knew what they were eating on today, that only would lean at potential means of how of how we go on onto this route um but i you know again there the reason this is cool is they're suggesting it's a rare evolutionary phenomenon it's happening fast and real time in these bat species so it's the fact that it's happening happening in a a mammal is really exciting 
that they can actually be observing this and it's it's really cool and brings to a lot of questions including how we define a species what's driving this and i think it'd be important to continue studying these animals and figuring out what continual differences are happening yeah i also like the little bit that they had in there about how um these bats are you know currently threatened by human activity and a lot of these environments as a whole are, are kind of under threat so it's important to understand these and parts so that we can help protect them like there are all of these really cool biological stories in there we need to appreciate those and hopefully then we can we can convince people to preserve these ecosystems so i don't remember if it was in the paper or the press release but i really like that little code that they put on there as well yeah so in, in the in the press release there was a quote from the researchers and i have it up it's Islands are famous for helping us observe and understand the processes for how species evolve in real time. There are also places that are very vulnerable to different types of disturbance created by humans. It's important that we look after these incredible landscapes in the Solomon Islands before we lose these stories, even before we find them. Yeah. So I think it was well said, but it was also like frustrating that we have to say this, you know? But hopefully the, the work of, of these researchers, um, you know, will we'll get attention and will inspire people to help protect these ecosystems. I'm really glad that there's a press release here. Um, it's, yeah, although, was this the one that I was looking at where, uh, yeah, the, have you ever had this happen, Valent, where you, you send your press release to the press office and then they they mess it up. Here they it looks like they accidentally duplicated it, so it's the same text twice in the press release. This has been out for a few days and it's not been corrected yet. Um, so like, I was I was it. reading it, and I thought yeah. I had gone crazy because I was like, me too, yeah. <laughs> I I was like I've read this before. What is this? What is yeah. happening? And then no, it was yeah. I yeah. Somebody just pressed, you know. Control C, and then they accidentally did Control V twice, and then they published it. And uh, again, this is not the researchers that made that mistake. This is somebody in the press office for the university. Um, it seems like to the whose whole job it is to, just to not mess this up. And then, and then, yeah. I I talked to Lita about this because we were talking at one point about press releases for Friday's stream, and she actually uh, hates Eureka Alert because apparently they're oh, yeah. they're notorious for making these kinds of errors. <laughs> Yep. yep. And there's also I, no I've colleagues who Yeah, sorry. Oh no, there's just no standardization of like what's quality and what's not. It's just yeah. like this kind of anything yep. goes kind of deal. And university press offices could be really bad about that too, where they'll like, you know, you can write a beautiful press release and then you send it to the press office and they like tweak a bunch of the language and they introduce a bunch of errors or things that aren't true and like they're trying to make it like, you know, more accessible to the public, even if you've already done that, and then they just, you know, they butcher it. They're like they're calling ichthyosaurs a kind of dinosaur, or they do this or that, where it's just they completely. So that's frustrating. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened here, but. Well, you know, you have to call it a dinosaur to get more clicks on it. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, even just, like, retyping the researchers' names and getting the spelling wrong and stuff like that. Like, just really basic errors. We um, had a, a press release from Emory when I was an undergrad over a paper we had. And my uh, name was misspelled by the university office. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's still, it, I, I still found it, like, a while ago. And I'm like, oh, it's still there. It's still, like, <laughs> I, I have, like, E's thrown in my name. And I'm like, this isn't even someone else reporting it. This is, like, the university not doing a copy and paste job. Yep. Uh, and it's like, you had one job. <laughs> the press office, you have one job. How do you manage to mess it up this badly? <laughs> uh, yeah. And Agathor yeah. asks uh, an interesting question. Would you agree with the statement that this island can also cause evolution niches? that can limit a species' ability to adapt because they become too specialized, and that could lead to the animal being endangered. Oh, uh, it... So... That's a good question. Um, 
Under normal circumstances, I would say creatures are not going to be going extinct left and right. So the whole idea of like a background extinction rate, I don't necessarily buy that idea. Um, it'll be like sudden rapid changes in the environment that can drive species into extinction. Um, this idea of like evolutionary senility or something like that, or like over-specialization on islands. I mean, you can have species that exist on tiny islands um, that arrive there and then the island shrinks due to rising sea levels or something like that. And then certain resources disappear and then they, they, I guess they can blink out of existence because you have stuff like that happening, but it's, it's usually some external force that, that does that. Whether it's climate change, whether it's extreme drought, whether it's a volcanic eruption or something like that. Um, you know, trying to like blame organisms like, oh, you became too specialized and that's why you deserve to go extinct. You know, I always try and push back against that idea. I don't know if that's what you were uh, implying there, Agathor, but, uh, but yeah. I think yeah. this this data almost argues the opposite. Right, where instead of going extinct, you had a speciation event that was driven by these yeah. niches, and so you're actually expanding the populations of now two different types of bats, uh, where there was just one, because there is the room for them, and again, the selection pressures are driving towards specialization. It does sometimes make them, I think, vulnerable, like with the hell ant, where we know that their prey started to go extinct, and then they were so specialized in terms of the morphology of the animal that they had nothing that they could go after uh, so i i also wonder about that though because that's to me that almost reads as like a just so story as a paleontologist where it's like you can i don't know it's like an archaeologist coming up with an artifact and like what we don't know what it's for so we'll say religious purposes you know or ceremonial use or something so to like to say that a species went extinct because it became over specialized is almost it's like a a catch-all canard, like a, super, something that's super easy to say, but it's really, really difficult to demonstrate that over-specialization is what actually caused an extinction. Yeah, you that's know? fair. I, Because I, I mean, how yeah. would one prove that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Because, um, I mean, of the Helland, there's such a gap in the fossil record. There's a 40 million year old gap where there's no specimens, yeah. and then it's like, well... <laughs> I don't like. Yeah, I guess that's a great thought exercise. Would you find some kind of regression intermediates where they're trying? Like, it's almost like there's selection pressures. Ask, at, you know, pushing on shortened mandibles, and maybe it was just like that's where you'd find that they had less and less like colony sizes, maybe decreased or something. But you know, right now we don't even know what the colony size is. We don't even know necessarily if they lived in. Co we don't know that a hundred percent, right? But they even no, that's uh, that's one of those. Uh, I think uh, kind of how you're saying it as maybe a just. We're just guessing because it's it fits in. Yeah. With uh -huh. the the theories, but no, I have never seen like a, a specimen that had multiple hell ants together in a group. So yeah, yeah, shoot. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I I think I just kind of. My heckles get raised a little bit when uh, when somebody says, "Oh, well, these, you know, of course they went extinct. They became over specialized." That's what people used to say about dinosaurs back in the day. Um, they're like, "Oh, yeah, you know, you just had this group that they just became." They used to have this term called evolutionary senility. They're like, "Oh, yeah, after a group is around for long enough, they just kind of lose their marbles and develop weird structures on their heads, and then they go extinct." It's like. They just become evolutionary, evolutionarily senile, and there was never any evidence for that. And I don't know how that idea came about in the first place, um, but nowadays we have a pretty good idea of why the dinosaurs went extinct, except for a handful of bird species, and uh, it was very much like a catastrophe. Um, you know, an external force that caused that. Species don't normally just go extinct for the heck of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I I like that analogy. They don't go just for the heck of it. There's like the external yeah. pressures of it, which they're like, oh, whoop, time to die. They don't they don't really do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've become. Look at my horns. I, it's time for me to go. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it's still yeah. It's I I really like that mindset. I guess I hadn't thought of it that way of how really difficult it is to demonstrate yeah. anything. Something like a 
a spe the over specialization like that's you know that had been the argument and this is why these chats are cool y'all because from the molecular side of things like i don't really think of this on a day-to-day -day. so the one bi current bio paper where we looked at and like the hell ant and it's discovered like that was the suggestion I'm like oh yeah sure i i can buy that but danny like highlights with his expertise like actually if we break it down while that could have happened how does one actually prove something like that like it's not just a nice throwaway term it's actually super important yeah and it, it, it strikes me this like over specialization idea as something that you you would hear proposed at the beginning of the study of a certain group and like the more we learn about that group the more we realize there's a lot of intricacies there's a lot of other stuff going on it's not as simple as oh they over specialized and then they die um yeah yeah i feel like i've seen i've seen this story before numerous times in the history of, of the study of different groups of organisms yeah. no I, I really like that explanation I appreciate that uh, Dacum sleep yeah. well hybrid robotics welcome the heck in um, so Danny how do you feel about this paper are you are you buying that there's some differences here that these are two species that this is interesting to look at I, it's definitely interesting to look at are they two species yet um, who's to say I mean shoot <laughs> Like we were talking about, what is this species? Where do you draw those lines? I love that this is, this this really highlights the the ambiguity and the gray areas there, because that's how biology works, you know. Um, yeah, I thought it was really neat, and hopefully this helps inspire people to, to preserve these ecosystems, and um, so we can figure out what's going on here, because we can't do that if they go extinct. Um, these. Solomon Islands are not a great place to preserve fossils, so we're not going to expect to find a lot of fossils of these bats. Bats <laughs> notoriously do not fossilize well, so let's keep them alive so we can study them, you know? Yeah. Like how uh, Lordy came in here, and what is a species with the, <laughs> the IOs? <laughs> my, my, my. Yeah. I mean, so, like, yeah. in all seriousness, though, that is something that I find really frustrating in, in between these new species papers. Not like this one, but just as a whole when you're looking at just the genetic side of things and that's supposed to be your end all and you kind of lose what you've learned in like paleontology with the morphological characteristics form and function like how you've said to us right where you're putting all your eggs in the molecular basket if you look at different papers the thresholds for what defines a species in terms of like the molecular differences are different yep yep <laughs> and and it's, it it, it yeah. drives me wild because it's accepted. It's like, oh yeah, this is a new species, but the category that you just had in the same journal on a different paper, same edition of that output, yeah. the threshold was different. And so how does then yeah. what yeah, it gets back to then what is that species? Yep. Yep, trying to trying to put these critters into different little boxes that we call species. Like, there's always going to be some overflow or some critter that doesn't quite, fit, you know. Where do you draw the boundaries between these these species that had just recently split from one another? Um, you know, it's a spectrum, and I know that's kind of frustrating to hear sometimes, but that's how nature works. Yeah. And yeah. that that might be the perfect uh, jump into the next paper, one of yours. Would you like? Do you, or we think? Uh... Oh shoot! Yeah, uh, get into Andrea Cow's paper on on theropod dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this, Belen, because uh, let me lay some groundwork for everybody in chat. I guess. Um, so. This gets into some of my history. I used to work at a museum in Montana called Museum of the Rockies. Jack Horner um, was my old boss there. He was like the head of paleontology there. Um, and Jack Horner was really interested, is really interested in, in how dinosaurs live, what were their social structures like, how can we figure that out, and also understanding dinosaur growth. So they're, in the early history of dinosaur paleontology, there was this mad rush to go out and find a bunch of different dinosaur specimens and then name as many as people could. And so dinosaurs that looked a little bit different, people would name them something different. They'd come up with new names for them. And there there were, at one time, just for Triceratops, the big three-horned dinosaur at the end of the Cretaceous, there were like 20-something different species of Triceratops that were named. Triceratops eurycephalus, Triceratops... Uh, Hatcheri, Triceratops, 
Prosaurus, Triceratops Hortus, blah 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 blah, a whole bunch of them. 20 plus species. It turns out there's probably just two species? Maybe three? But they existed at different times. One evolved into the other, evolved into the other. There's just a lot of variation in Triceratops in terms of different individuals would look a little bit different. Individual variation. And also a ton of what we call ontogenetic variation. Variation when a baby Triceratops grows up into an adult, you've got a lot of changes that are going on in its morphology. A lot of changes in the shape of its skull, the orientation of the horns, the little spiky bits along the edge of the frill. All these things are changing as the animal grows and develops. And those are not differences in different species. That's just like one individual animal as it grows and matures will look very different at different stages of growth. So changes in ontogeny. Ontogeny is like the life history of an individual animal or individual organism, I guess. Not to be too animal centric. Um, but uh, it turns out dinosaurs seem to change a tremendous amount through ontogeny and a bunch of things that we used to think were different species of dinosaur it appears in a lot of these cases it's just different growth stages of the same species they look that different at different growth stages throughout an individual animal's life it changes that much and so this paper here by italian paleontologist andrea cow he's a phylogeneticist paleontologist so like he mostly creates phylogenetic trees and studies the interrelationships of these different dinosaurs he has this idea that these little two-legged meat-eating dinosaurs Compsognathans. This is like a family of dinosaurs that everybody's recognized up until this point. He doesn't think that they're actually like a family of dinosaurs. He thinks that each of these might just be juveniles, babies, of dinosaur groups that we already know about. Um, and so that was a big part of this paper, is him arguing that, like, hey, Compsognathans, not a real group. All these things that we call Compsognathans are just babies of tyrannosauroids, allosauroids, megalosauroids. And so that's part of it. And then part of it is also trying to come up with a, a way to, to code phylogenetic trees where you can account for ontogeny. You can, you, can, um, you can throw a juvenile animal in there and you code it as a juvenile and it won't mess up your tree. Because the way that it's happened before is that if you take a juvenile dinosaur um, and you, you code it into one of these phylogenetic trees, it kind of messes things up. It'll change the topology of the tree. It'll, uh, it'll make it so that usually the younger an animal is, the more basal it appears on the tree. So like the more primitive or ancestral it looks. Um, and so he's basically trying to like come up with a, a method of, of accounting for that so that you don't get your results skewed. And uh, I think it's a really interesting paper, but it's going to upset a lot of dinosaur paleontologists because it is kind of a radical idea that, like, this whole family of dinosaurs over here, they're not actually different. They're just babies of other dinosaur groups. So does that make sense? I've been talking for a while. It's this reductionist movement almost, right? It's, um, what, there was a, t two schools of thought that you told us about what are I can't remember um, what are those two. It's the um, lumpers and splitters. Yes, that's it. Lumpers and splitters, and it almost feels like it's yeah. trying to pull everyone back. Yeah. And not, so yeah, th that's a, a thing in in taxonomy, biological taxonomy, lumpers versus splitters. It's like with our bats, everybody that we were looking at. Uh, a lumper would be like, oh, you know, they're the same species. You know, there's just a lot of variation. And splitters would be like, oh, you know, they're clearly two different species. Look at how different they are. Um, nobody wants to be a lumper or a splitter. These are both kind of pejorative terms. Um, but I'll cop to it. I'm, I'm a lumper, you know. I, I, I tend to, to value the similarities over the differences when I'm looking at fossil organisms. And so I, I tend to think that, like, things have got to be real different for them to be different species. Um, and but they're that's the thing is that I feel like in the in dinosaur paleontology as a whole I feel like more dinosaur workers trend towards splitting because everybody wants things to be different you want to be able to name a new species you want high biodiversity in, in dinosaur dominated ecosystems 
that's fun for everybody. Everybody loves dinosaurs. Everybody wants to have as many dinosaurs as possible. Um, and shoot, if you can get attention or, or grant money for like naming new species, um, you know, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> um, so this is going to upset a lot of people in like saying, yeah, a bunch of your different dinosaurs, they're, they're actually not different. Yeah, I I liked it. <laughs> I I kind of yeah. because it's not I don't like the necessary like what the idea of like let's just get rid of stuff because that's not how I took it. I took it as yeah. taking a more holistic look at a dinosaur's life and incorporating that into the definition of what makes it that dinosaur, what makes it that species. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and I thought uh -huh. this figure right here, this was the figure that I that really spoke to me that I really liked. Uh, because okay. it, it incorporates a bunch of unique variables. And if everyone used all these variables and way of measurements, it would actually come together and be like, this is how you can, this is when we define a new species, right? So like one of these elements of having the maturity score uh -huh. Right. Of and, and this correct me if I'm wrong, Danny, this takes into account that you have to look deeper into like the bone architecture and like getting age of the animals too, like whether it be drilling into the bone or yeah. you know, getting like more information. Like we talked about last week. Yeah. yeah. Where where it's yeah. like you can't just like pulling out a bone is no longer sufficient to define yeah. it as a new species. Like it you have to have comparison between what exists, what you found yeah. And what now it's also going to the hard part, right, is what we define as something different mm -hmm. and maybe thinking that it's not different. Yeah. So I, I yeah. think it's very complicated, but I really like this figure because I think this kind of illustrates the whole point of, you know, is this tiny dinosaur really a tiny dinosaur or is it just an immature form of the big one at the end? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And part of this is that you got to remember that dinosaurs did not give birth to live young. They all laid eggs. You know, even the very biggest dinosaurs, the biggest of the sauropods, they could be like 130 feet long, size of like a Boeing 737. They all hatched out of eggs no bigger than this. They all start off the size of, I don't know, like a chihuahua. Uh, the very biggest dinosaurs all start off real small, and they've got to do a tremendous amount of growing to reach that full adult size. And they're going to look different at these different stages of growth. And they're probably doing different things. They're probably in different ecological niches, you know? Which was proven. A little baby T-Rex is not going to be hunting down and eating Alamosaurus or anything. They're going to be eating, you know, insects and frogs and, and you know, lizards and whatever. And that mammals, was proven, right? Our ancestors. We, we yeah. looked at a paper, uh, what, like a month or two ago, of what was uh -huh. in the baby t-rex's belly and it was different yeah. than what the adult ate right so there's On even the breathing, yeah. this isn't a revolutionary yeah. idea there are well you'd be surprised <laughs> there's, there's a lot of paleontologists who, who don't don't want to you know i don't know they're not they're not eager to accept that idea but also part of this comes into parental care too so if you assume that Tyrannosaurus, the T-Rex, was like uh, exhibiting really strong parental care and feeding the youngsters, if they, then the youngsters would be eating the same thing as the adults, mm -hmm. you know? Um, if they're taking down large prey and then feeding it to the youngsters, then they could be in the same niche, I guess. If they always lived in family groups like this and the adults are just feeding the young, then maybe they're not in different ecological niches throughout their life. Um, but I'm not convinced that they were doing that. We do have evidence of that in certain dinosaurs, like hadrosaurs. We know for a fact that they fed their babies. Um, like in the nest, their babies couldn't even walk. They're what we call altricial. So like altricial birds are ones that, you know, they're born featherless and blind in the nest and the parents have to come feed them. Like baby robins or sparrows. Um, or baby pigeons. Or then you have precocial. Precocial birds are birds that can just get up and run like 20 minutes after they're after they hatch. Um, and we have evidence that theropod dinosaurs, two-legged meat-eating dinosaurs, were mostly precocial. Like they seem to be well developed. They could probably just get up and run not long after they hatch. Maybe like 
within an hour or something. Um, we don't, in the degree of parental care there, might have implications for what niche they were in and that sort of thing, but a lot of this stuff we just don't know yet. Um, but I suspect that dinosaurs are moving through different niches as they're growing and maturing, uh, especially theropod dinosaurs like this, you know. Uh, and Belint, by the way, um, your favorite dinosaur, you Tyrannus, uh, there is a chance that that is just an adult Sinoceropteryx. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, since they, I think they're from the same formation. They're both from Liaoning province in mm -hmm. China. And um, Sinoceropteryx, who's uh, right up here, I've got that image of the original fossil, that's why I put it up today. That is, Sinoceropteryx has been called a, a Compsognathid dinosaur. So, you know, same family as Compsognathus. It, that might not be a real family like we were talking about. It could just be a juvenile of a larger meat-eating dinosaur in the same formation. In this case, maybe U. Tyrannus. Um, and I think Andrea Cow, uh, in his phylogeny, it came out closest to the Tyrannosauroids. U. Tyrannus seems to be a Tyrannosauroid, so it could be a juvenile U. Tyrannus, potentially. Yeah. And, and is that relative that it might end up actually being also feathered? Yeah. So then yeah. you're... So Sinusoropteryx, we know, had feathers. That's the first dinosaur... The first non-avian dinosaur was like, holy cow, these things had feathers. That was 1996. Was gotcha. Huge deal. That was that critter. I have I have emotes of that little guy. Claire Burgess. Oh, just, nice. Uh, I, I, I've, I'm tail, scrolled yeah. up, so I didn't see them. But yeah, nice. Yeah, I do yeah. love, by the way, chat, Danny makes these emotes live. I've seen him make these emotes. They're really, really cool. Like, <laughs> we have a real-life dino scientist making, like, accurate dinosaur emotes. It's so cool. I'm trying to, yeah. I need to do some more. It's been a while. Uh there was a, a you were, we were starting to answer this a little bit stay lifted was wondering about that parental care element to it that if uh -huh. if we did have these ranges and sizes would you predict that with the little ones you might have bigger ones in the nearby area that it could represent right parents versus juveniles and you know it'd be all kind of clustered together almost in a colony like setting that you can see the the track of movement or it might be ones like you were saying the theropods if they're ready to go uh -huh. They might be more likely to just go off on their own, and that be might be minimal parental care. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the question is. Um, but so I, I, I guess like how would agreement. how would that fill in? Like how can we use? Uh -huh. Is there a means by which we can use um, the location of where these animals are and imply parental data? Or like, and, and could that fit into this model, or is that a little bit too? We don't we don't have uh, a clear enough picture of what's going on in these ecosystems to, to have the those kinds of data. Um, yeah, especially since a lot of these fossils are transported after death and stuff like that. That like where exactly they are geographically is not gonna. We don't, we don't have that kind of resolution. Yeah. So you yeah. mean transported after death, like? If they were like a river or something moved them, or some kind of land movement, Maybe. rain or, yeah. Yeah, usually usually river fluvial activity. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's uh, right. It's like the Utyranus one that you told us about, where it was three three individuals in a location. Yeah, so they that could even be a family group or something potentially. Um, in that particular taphonomic setting, that would be I think at the bottom of a, a shallow lake. Um, Liaoning province. Y Yishian formation it probably is. Um, yeah, so they, they did not get moved very far uh, just based on how pristine everything is. They probably did not get transported a great distance. They probably died right close nearby. And that's probably um, just luck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it could be that was a family group. They might all be related to each other. Because you know. there had been, uh, right... Maybe it was an adult and two juveniles or something. Yeah, because we we had yeah. you had shown a video which I thought was really fascinating that there was and I you know it was this it felt like to me at the time this big jump, um, um, that it was like maybe they hunted in groups, based off the collection of data that they the three of these were found close together. That's that's the thing is that anytime you find dead dinosaurs in a spot, it's like well. Were they actually cool with hanging out there, or did they 
you know, did something go wrong and they died? Like, it's like looking at stomach contents. It's like you find pine needles, preserved pine needles in the in the gut of a, a duckbill dinosaur, and it's like, was that its normal food, or did it die during a drought and that was its last meal and it's munching on pine needles because it's starving to death and there's nothing around to eat? You know, like. These are the questions that you got to ask when you're dealing with the remains of dead animals like this. Is that actually a part of the animal's daily experience, or is that something associated with what killed the animal? You know, which I I yeah. think brings into a, a good question is, given like this setup of like what the uh -huh. definition is of how to identify the new species, like you said, yeah. all the difficulties of telling some of these things apart because right diet you could argue is a factor that you could trace over time and that could be that ontogenetic one right where you have a, you're young you're sure. eating something different than when you're old given that yeah. so many things could be influencing what you find how likely is it that this could be easily adopted where you could have the evidence to actually do what the the, the mission of this sets out uh, I mean if we had more people working in the field of dinosaur paleontology, like, you know, this could be a few different PhD projects and, and stuff. Like, there could be people who could really figure this sort of thing out, but, um, I don't know how much incentive there is to do that, honestly. <laughs> um, so, I guess, what, what do you mean by that? Like, I think this is not a super popular idea. Okay. Um, because there is some incentive to like always want to name new dinosaurs, um, and like not. Eventually, the truth will come out here, like one way or another. It could be that this is all completely wrong, and that, yeah, they are different species. Um, but there's there's headwinds working against uh, synonymizing different dinosaurs together, like saying these are different growth stages of the same animal. Um, the way that you would actually try and falsify that hypothesis, the way that you could try and like disprove that once and for all, would be to look at these specimens and do histo on them. Actually cut open those bones and look at the, the growth rings inside, figure out which ones are juveniles and which ones are adults, and then uh, combine that with finding more fossils of these critters with more like intermediate growth stages. Maybe they don't have intermediate growth stages because maybe they're different species entirely that's how you would actually go about like testing this idea in a rigor as well so you think the primary means of evidence to be able to test this would be like looking and actually boring into the bone and getting the doing the microscopy on them and maybe yeah. di things like diet would be a secondary thing if we can find that preserved in the fossil record like you'd be looking primarily we do bone have that for a lot of these okay uh so with like Sinusoropteryx, um, uh, Cosignathus, I think maybe even Jura Venator or Scipionix, uh, Scipionix, excuse me, we have, we do have gut contents for some of these critters. We can tell that like, you know, Sinusoropteryx ate a mammal and a lizard before it died. Cosignathus, I think, had a, a lizard in its guts um, when it died too. And so like, they're eating small prey. Um, probably not something that like an adult would be feeding them. Uh, if they were not adults, which that's the thing is that like everybody's suspected for a long time that these animals are not mature, but it's just, you know, oh, maybe the mature individual would be two feet longer or something instead of 28 feet longer. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so are you thinking that there's a primary means of telling these apart? Like, or if they, if they fall together, which is the bone histology. Uh, that's like that's your silver bullet there. Yeah. Like if uh, I'm I'm kind of unconvinced that a dinosaur is is ever mature unless you can show an EFS in it, unless you can show an external fundamental signature in the bone histology. So that's like that's the super tightly packed growth rings around the perimeter where it's like, yep, this animal's done growing. The the growth rings are getting so close together that they're indistinguishable now, and so like the animal has reached skeletal maturity, it's not growing it. Um. Very, very few dinosaurs ever show that. The majority of dinosaur specimens that we have, the vast majority that anybody's ever sampled, they're still growing. Um, it seems like dinosaurs that reached a ripe old age are, are pretty rare. Uh, 
Uh, and that kind of speaks to this idea even more that like a lot of these things are probably the same species, <laughs> um, just different growth stages. And like only when we find that EFS do we really know that they were done growing and they're fully mature, which is very different from like mammals and critters today. Like, you know, mammals tend to grow pretty quickly and then they're done. And also there's one mammal species per niche usually. Um, they're not moving through different niches as they grow and develop because mammals feed their young with milk. So like a baby elephant is not going around and sucking up mosquitoes or, or, um, or I don't know, eating something different from the adults do. A baby elephant is feeding on mother's milk until it's big enough to just eat what mom is eating. Um, and so it's kind of like one niche per mammal species. With dinosaurs, if they are really growing from the size of a chihuahua to the size of a bus, and um, you know, they're going to be eating different things at different growth stages, and they're going to be moving through different niches, different ecological jobs as they reach different size classes and have the ability to eat different foods. Yeah. And it kind of stems back, I was I can't remember if it was a paper we were talking about or just the fundamental concept of like the origin of mammalian evolution, that there were these small uh, critters and they have this really like short lifespan and have to develop really quickly so they can reproduce. Right. Yep. And so maybe that's why, like if we're looking at it from this bone histological comparison and you're expecting mammalian, but really like uh -huh. there, that selection pressure and how those mammals evolved wasn't there. And so... Yep. Yeah, yeah. I think it speaks to how little we actually know about the aging process in these animals. Right? If you're For not sure. finding, like, yeah. old specimens, mm -hmm. why is that? Like, is, yeah. is there a fundamental end in growth? And presumably there is at some point, right? But what is that well, end? There definitely is for dinosaurs. Like, we, there's this old myth that, like, oh, dinosaurs got so big because they lived 300 years. No. The very old, the most mature dinosaurs that we have are, like, maybe in their 40s. Mm -hmm. um, and then they'll show that EFS. They'll show that, that tapering off of growth. Um, where they, they've stopped growing. But it's rare to find that. It's like most of the dinosaurs that we have are like, they were still very much growing. Dinosaurs seem to have lived fast and died young most of the time. Huh. Um, yeah. And they grew really fast too. It's not like they're growing really slowly. They grew remarkably quickly, but... It's like very few of them ever actually seem to reach that ripe old age. Um, and we'll find more of those ripe old age dinosaurs if we cut more bones, but we just haven't gotten to that stage yet. Like so far, the oldest dinosaur we have is like 40 years old. Huh. Um, maybe 48, 49, something like that. So, but um, like not really. And it, it, presumably we have them on hand. As they just... are, they're way younger than you'd expect them to be. Yeah. yeah, and I, I wonder yeah. too if if a good p component of that is that we just haven't looked because we might have the samples. That's a big part of it. Yeah, but we just haven't sure. drilled into them. And like it's it's just wild to me too. Like the holotypes, there's so so much protection on them. And you know, I was like naively when you mentioned, it, I was like, well, is it gonna blow up the sample in some weird? And no, it's just like you said, it's just a little drill. You patch it well, up afterwards. No one in the well, public. Saw. So you're cutting the bone open and you're taking maybe a, an inch or two inch wide segments out of it. Well, it's a um, little sliver, you know, like relative, like you're not destroying it. It's still there on display. I agree, and... I agree with you 100%, but I'm trying to play devil's advocate for the sake of people who would disagree with me. Where they're like, well, these are really precious specimens. There might be only one example of this dinosaur in the entire world. And so we can't afford to lose any sliver of the bone, you know? Uh... I would disagree with this. I think we collect these specimens to gather data on them and to understand these animals. But, you know, there are a lot of people whose job there is, like collections managers, to protect these fossils. And so they don't want any kind of what they might call destructive sampling used on them whatsoever. Um, and maybe they're right. Maybe maybe someday in the future we'll have a way to, to just put these through a scanning device where you don't even have to touch the fossils and you can get the same information. You know, maybe there'll be some magical technology in the future where that's possible, but we're not there yet. Um, I say, you know, gather ye rosebuds, well you may. Let's let's do this now. We can always go out and find more specimens. You know, stop having this scarcity mindset about it. But so a lot naive, of my colleagues disagree. You know? Naive question for you, Danny. Let's say that we uh -huh. have this just one specimen of this dinosaur, like you were saying. Sure. What is when the argument is, well, we can't afford to lose a sliver, 
No. What would you do with said sliver? What is the purpose of like, wh- like why would why would you? What about losing that sliver is detrimental to the the sample itself in the sense of what what are we saving uh-huh. it for? If that makes sense, like with the counter argument, like what is does Ooh, that make it's sense? And you don't want to. You don't want to. Uh, I don't know. Okay. So it's it's more of just a like sentimental value. Like we found this early on, or this is the one specimen, and we worry that if you look at it, you're gonna just destroy it. Is it like a naive? Maybe. Kind of, you know, I I have a a video about this if you want to take a look. It's like three minutes long, and I think she kind of walks you through the the whole process. Um, do you want to look at that? Yeah, if you have time. Yeah. Yeah. Um. There's a link right there. Uh, should be Acrocanthosaurus dinosaur femur histology. Um, All right. Let me just zoom it behind us. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Hi, my name's Lisa Herzog. I'm in the paleontology research lab here at the museum. And in front of me, laid out, I have a femur of a fossil uh, theropod dinosaur known as Acrocanthosaurus. Acrocanthosaurus is one of our most famous specimens that is on display and mounted in the museum. However, we had to take the original bones off display so that we could preserve them. This fossil has something known as pyrite disease or pyrite decay, which can be very detrimental for a specimen if it's not stored in a controlled environment. Exposure to oxygen. Or it'll like expand and contract and crumble to dust if it's got pyrite decay. Is that common? Uh, It's not super rare, but um, it's something you got to think about. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever actually worked on a specimen with pyrite disease, but um, the all the iguanodon from Bernisar in Belgium, like we were talking about yesterday, they've got that. That's when the, the miners originally found those bones. They thought they'd struck gold because they has like fool's gold inside pyrite. Oh. You know? <laughs> that's, yeah. That's, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, okay. So it's like the, yeah. the minerals that, that formed inside the bone to, to fossilize it. It's like, oh shoot, there's pyrite in there. And pyrite flux like it, it expands and contracts with different temperatures and humidities so like you got to keep that nice and constant or else it'll expand and contract and just turn your bones to dust i guess i naively thought that it would be even more commonplace than what it already like how you were saying it's not like super common like not super rare yeah. but yeah yeah in the atmosphere and moisture in the atmosphere can cause the pyrite to decay the specimen. So we've taken it off display yeah. and it's safely stored in cabinetry downstairs. Now She's that the specimen's the off display, one of the things we are doing with it is conducting additional research on the specimen to help with the body of research on this particular animal. The process we're doing is called uh, creating a histological slide or it's also known as histology. Yeah which means that we're going to be looking at the specimen on a microscopic level in cross section. So what we have to do for that is- Is is this in part motivated because they took it off display so they don't have to worry about the public like bringing it back and forth. It's just now it's in a a box and it's just easier to get to. They've got it back in the collections now or in the laboratory and they, yeah. So um, when I worked at Museum of the Rockies, sometimes bones would be taken off of display to cut them open and create a thin section and everything. And I always think that's really cool. Anytime you go to a museum and it's like, like, well, th- this case is empty and there's a little note and it's like specimen taken off of display for research purposes temporarily. It's like, I always think that's really cool. It, it shows that like, this is a, a living, breathing museum. Like there is actual work being done here. It's not just dusty bones up on display. It's like, no, this is an active research program. I always think that's exciting but some people get disappointed. I think it's one of those things I didn't really realize until you did your museum tour and you showed uh-huh. us like the back room where they had like all the ventilation systems and you told us about like why they have these yeah, vents yeah. because if you're drilling in and the dirt being and dust and that you yeah. you saw people working on it and it's you kind of lose that 
perception of a museum as anything beyond just looking at stuff, that there is this active research going on and someone's curating these things yeah. and all the work that goes into that. It's not just... And that's that's 90% of what a museum is. It's like, what you're seeing is just the tip of an iceberg uh, as, uh, as a visitor. Most of it is like the collections in the back, the laboratory, or the offices with people doing research, that kind of thing. So it's it's cool when that when that encroaches a little bit into the exhibits as well. Um, or like I've done this before, where I visited museums and it's like I have to take measurements or photographs of a specimen that's on display, and so like I'll go there with security and they'll cordon off the area, we'll open up the glass case, and I'm there taking photos and measurements and stuff, and a crowd gathers around and I get to talk to them about it, you know. That's those are some of my, my favorite experiences in museums. Um, yeah, it, it's it's cool to be able to remind people that like this museum exists for the sake of scientific research, not just for pretty objects on display. Like we're doing science here, you know. Well, and the fact that you're also accessible, as you're like, yeah. you're the one doing the internal measurements and telling people like yeah, this is why I'm doing this. This is what it's telling us. Like that's that's huge. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 always a privilege to be able to do that. Like it's it's a good feeling. Yeah. Cut the specimen in half before we go through this whole process. We consult with with um, other members of the department to make sure that this is a worthwhile venture because it is a destructive process. So I've already gone through the first step of this process. I cut the bone in half and then I cut a section out of it. And here's what it looks like now. After the this, this section was cut out, this little slice, resin. I embedded it in a clear epoxy resin for stability. I'm going to be polished. And this is what we would cut, right, for the histological sections? Bingo. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you got to take a chunk out of the, the midsection of the femur there. And, like, that's... Presumably she made a cast of this in advance. So like that chunk that she took out before she embedded it in resin She made an exact copy of that so she could take the copy and glue it back in place and have a, a complete hole again, you know, gotcha um, Yeah, yeah, I guess I was almost envisioning a different kind of removal uh, I, I didn't I didn't realize lot, that it was a full cut it's, like it's this It's not as precise as like you'd be used, you know, it's not not a pipe pattern or anything. It's well, like, it's a big naive, rock saw that you yeah, use. Yeah, you know? that makes sense. Yeah. I guess I was almost yeah. thinking that you, you're doing like a little, almost a biopsy, uh -huh. where you cut into the bone, like a rectangle, oh, remove just take a, out a plug or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, this, no, this is like we're taking out the midsection of the femur. <laughs> oh, but if you do it right. And then you make a cast of that midsection, put it back, paint it. You know, visitors aren't going to know the difference. Um, right. And also that, that chunk that you took out, it's not like you throw that into the trash afterward. That ends up in the collections next to the femur. Like, you still have that so you can study it. People can do more thin sections of that one section if they need to. Yeah. And presumably that doesn't run out. Like, a, 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 I guess unless you sectioned it to nothing. It is. It is a finite resource, and like, like that's, that's the thing, thing is you got to be really, really good, good with the saw in order to be able to do this correctly. Like, like I've, I've heard, heard horror stories, stories about like, oh shoot, shoot we did this, and we didn't have anything we could use. Um, oh, oh, like like removing it. Does it happen? Yeah, yeah, like, like if, if, if if sometimes, sometimes it just doesn't, doesn't cooperate. Like, like sometimes, sometimes, and like she'll talk about it here, but like once you have it embedded in resin, you've got to take a smaller slice of it, and then you have to grind that part down to the point where it's thin enough that light can pass through it. You can look at it under a microscope. So I guess so it's, a, also it's a little similar to the, the fly study that was done where they took a fruit fly brain, embedded it in resin, and then needed uh -huh. to section it in such thin micron levels to then they can yeah. image each one and stitch uh -huh. it back together. If you yep. messed up on any, like, I mean, it's, it's finite in the sense if you mess up any one of those slices, you have to start all over because you're not going to see the yeah. neural connectivity. And another, another brave, brave fly, fly will, will have, have to sacrifice, sacrifice its life, you know? <laughs> Which, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little but different. Flies, but they're, they're probably a lot easier to come by than, uh, you know, Acrocanthosaurus skeletons. But, yeah. Uh, for now. So, for now. We're going to get now, more yeah. funding for the paleontologists. We'll be fine. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Polishing this real smooth and gluing it down to a slide, 
and then we're gonna polish it even more so it's very, very thin and transparent yep. and we can look at it with light transmitting through a, the slide on a microscope and we can actually see the cellular structure of the bone. One of the things that this can tell us is how an animal grew, if there's any sort of pathologies, meaning if it had any kind of diseases, it'll show up in its bone and it'll help us understand how old this animal might have been when it died. Was it Which is really, super really old? Was it a teenager? Was it still growing? We can tell that by looking at the specimen in this way. This is actually a pretty common method in paleontology, Not common uh, enough. especially for this type so of dinosaur. Yeah. So, is it just maybe common in the the protocol? I guess it's. I, she's probably making the point that it's not unique to this program or anything. Like, this is done around the world, but it's sometimes it's like pulling teeth, trying to, you know, trying to get permission to do this sort of thing. Um, certain museums will not let you do this at all whatsoever. And they might have their reasons, but I don't have to agree with them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And at certain museums, it's like, yeah, cut whatever you want. That's what the bones are here for, you know? And so does um, that come down to the curator? Yeah, it does come down to the curator and the collections manager and just kind of the general overall attitude at that institution. So like when I was at Museum of the Rockies, you know, cut everything. That's that's what it's about. That's why we're collecting these fossils in the first place. But um, you go to a place like Yale um, and a lot of those specimens, to be honest, most of their specimens are from like the 1800s um, when we're talking about dinosaurs and like they won't let you cut anything. Um, so, oh, these are historical specimens. It's like, you know, okay, are we here to do science? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, that's, that's just my view. So, yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things we're planning on doing with the dueling dinosaurs is processing the Tyrannosaur in this way so that it'll help us nice. understand that animal even better. And we're looking forward to doing yep. that process. Oh, so that one... And the, the dueling the dinosaurs is a, a small tyrannosaur and a triceratops preserved side by side together. Um, they were called dueling dinosaurs because some commercial collectors dug them up and they were trying to say, oh, they died in a fight. You know, they're trying to just get more money for it. And they're both new species. Um, but the small tyrannosaur, the, I think it's probably a juvenile tyrannosaurus, but a lot of people not a lot, but a few paleontologists think that it's Nanotyrannus. And so by actually cutting those bones open, you can figure out is it an adult Nanotyrannus, or is it just a juvenile T-Rex? Um, and just again, and so that's that one way to actually... Yeah, the cross-section again is that you'll, you know, like she said, you'll take a look and see if it's still growing or not. Bingo. Yeah, and that that's really our silver bullet for determining if a dinosaur is, is mature or not, is you have to do a histo section. Uh, other dinosaur paleontologists might argue that you can look at other things that are non-destructive, like are the vertebrae properly fused together? Are certain bones in the skull fused? Because um, if they're fused, that means that the animal is mature, but from everything that I understand about dinosaur osteology, those are not reliable indicators. Um, you can have animals that have fusion pretty early on in ontogeny, and animals that are more or less mature that don't necessarily have that kind of fusion Sometimes one half of the skull might be fused and not the other half of the skull. Um, just like left and right. Not even front to back, but left and right. Um, and it's just not a reliable indicator. Uh, also, a lot of this stuff is taphonomic, too. So, like, depending on the setting that the animal was buried in, it's a different place. Um, a big part of that was also whether or not it's articulated has a big uh, impact on that as well. Yeah. Raiders, welcome the heck in. Theory Space, how was your stream? Welcome, welcome in, everybody. How was it? What were y'all up to today? Uh, Theory Space, you were doing some Cult of the Lamb. Very cool. Did y'all gain any new cult members? Who was the new cult member? Tell us all the things, <laughs> Theory Space. It's actually a really cool game, Dan. You can interact with um, viewers, and they can be part of the, the, the cult, as it were, and like uh, do different... Can like, you play as the lamb? I think you are a lamb. Oh, cool. I think you are a <laughs> lamb in there. I know I, I've allegedly joined some of these, like, while watching some of our friends play it. And nice, nice. they have their say, your same names. Then you can, like, sometimes your character revolts or sometimes it behaves. Like, it was a... Uh, 
Yeah, it, it's so a, it's fun. an interesting yeah. game. Uh, but Raiders, let us know how it went. Uh, for those coming on in, my name is Belint, one third of Cyan Streams. The other two thirds are my wife Lita and our daughter Baby Alona. We're joined today by Professor Danny Anduza. So uh, we collectively do science here on Twitch. So Danny is a real life paleontologist, and uh, Lita and I are molecular biologists, and we bring science here to the platform. Uh, today is a day that we do a crossover stream with Danny and talk fossil science, genetics, and more. Make sure you're dropping him a follow. His name is in the episode description. He is Twitch Science Royalty. Chat. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to have science royalty on Twitch. I want I want science for the people. I want us all to be able to do science together. He's yeah. a democratic royal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, y'all. Um, welcome, anyway. welcome on in. Uh, Theory Space, how was the stream? Tell us all the things. I'm quickly, Danny, going to refresh your feed, by the way. Um, cool. Yeah, it seems I've got uh, it, it's several seconds per frame here, it looks like. Yeah, we were doing fine earlier. And then all of a sudden it cut to a, a freeze, and I'm not sure why. Hmm. Let's see. Looking better? Maybe? No, we're still on, on the... Oh, there... Uh, yeah, it's going by frame right now. Let me do a quick remove and add back. Okay. I'm not sure, because we were fine for a while, and then it just slowed down. I don't know if it's a guest star thing, or if it's if it's your machine is just being a little slow. Um, yeah. But yeah. as long as people can hear me, that's what's important. Yeah, sorry about that, Danny. It had been, I don't know, I think it might be a guest star thing because I got like this thing that popped up earlier um, yeah. when it started to slow down. And I, again, I'm not sure why. Like, it was just like, it was like, oh, having yeah, issue connecting to, to guest star was the, the error that we yeah. got. But we're, we're pushing through, y'all. We're pushing through. Theory Space says, um,. See, sometimes, uh, see, uh, packed up some sales, uh, go out tomorrow. The, uh, the stream got glitchy, so we gamed. Nice theory space. Well, welcome on in. If there's anything you want to share, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, we are talking with Danny about a really cool paper uh, on dinosaur science that is a little bit revolutionary because they're trying to suggest essentially downgrading the number of dinosaurs there are and kind of putting them together and taking more into account a little bit of the life history of the animals versus just uh, constantly saying there's a new dinosaur here, a new dinosaur there, a new dinosaur everywhere. Um, yeah, yeah, and it, it's uh, there's already a lot of people who are kind of upset about this paper, um, or not, a, not. That's not the right word. That'll, it's not giving them enough credit. Um, there are a lot of people who disagree with this paper. I'll say. Um, I think there's some really interesting, intriguing ideas in here, and I'd like to see them tested histologically. Um, but a, a bunch of this is kind of the methodology that's used here. I don't really have a strong opinion on because this is outside of what I do in dinosaur paleontology. Like I'm not really a phylogeneticist coming up with these different family trees like this is not my specialty. That's not really what I do. Um, but that is the specialty of this author. And, uh, I'd love to get the opinion of some paleontologists who actually do phylogenetics full-time you know specialize in that see what they think about this because i'm not really in a position to to evaluate it uh yeah outside my wheelhouse so is it one of those things where this is a great hypothesis it looks really cool uh -huh. but let's go ahead and try to do a test case and prove whether or not it's it's gonna work for yeah. what it's what it's demonstrating yeah that might be more or less impossible to do it the way that I suggested it because some of these specimens like the, you know, holotype of Compsognathus um, is, you know, a historical specimen. That was the first complete dinosaur skeleton ever found um, in Bavaria back in like the 1860s. Um, it's not, nobody's gonna let you cut that. Um, same with some of these fossils from China, Sinusoropteryx and stuff, these are important critters, like really important specimens, very precious. Um, so it, it's it's kind of frustrating like that. The, 
the the silver bullet to test this is not one that anybody's gonna let you fire. You know, uh, I'm mixing metaphors. There. And so that's what a little bit what Jimbo was asking is what exactly this would entail, and it's just like cutting into bone, right? at random museums yeah. and you're going to have to standardize it in a way to I would imagine so even if you did get permission to cut it would have to be the same type of uh, cut that go, is going in right sure. same maybe researcher yeah. doing too I don't know I'd still like I'd still really like to see it tested because I think this is a really really Absolutely, nice yeah. conclusive summary on how something like this might work and how to like tie together hypotheses that are a little bit all over the place definitely yeah, yeah, and I, I've, there, there's a, a, a cool, like, kind of slow motion revolution that's going on in dinosaur paleontology right now, I feel, where people are thinking more about dinosaur ontogeny, thinking about the, the growth and development of these animals throughout their lifespans, and realizing that, like, dinosaur ecosystems look very different from ecosystems today, um, in terms of their structure. Where like, uh, well, I don't know if you, we've talked about this on my channel before. Like the, the big gap that exists in meat-eating dinosaurs in the Cretaceous, where like there's a big size gap where you don't have medium-sized meat-eating dinosaurs in a lot of these formations, um, and that seems to be due to ontogeny. It's because instead of having medium body size meat-eating dinosaurs, instead those niches are being filled by the teenagers of larger dinosaur species. So like a, a teenager Tyrannosaurus would be filling that niche that you would you would normally have filled by like a medium sized meat eating dinosaur. Um, there's a lot of stuff like that going on, like people actually thinking about dinosaur communities in a different way um, that incorporates ontogeny and that's really cool to see. I'm, I'm hoping that this paper kind of contributes to that discussion and that uh, we can kind of form better hypotheses and find interesting ways to test them. Yeah, I mean, I think it would make a world of a difference, and it would make it a lot easier to interpret some of this data. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I like, as the more and more that we've talked, like, I do really like the idea of scaling down the number of new dinosaurs. And, <laughs> like, because it, it, it comes back to kind yeah. of almost the naming of genes like uh -huh. early on in, in genetics where it was like you cloned a gene that means you can name the gene and then you had uh -huh. just a bunch of repeats where it was like it's the same gene but in different animals and so now you can't actually tell them apart and so you have uh -huh. to get like a whole naming system and try to figure out how that works and like put them back together and it would just simplify everything yeah yeah um and so is it is this causing a stir just because it's again are is it is it because it's cutting into the fossils that it's causing a stir and like having these like no, it's not that so there's no histo being done in this in this paper um so the methodology here is just uh it's phylogenetics through coming up with morphological characters um so what andrea cow is doing is looking at these different dinosaur specimens and then assigning numeric values to different morphological character states, and then putting that into a clip, like create, generating a cladogram basically. Um, and but the way that he's coding these supposed juvenile dinosaurs is different from what's been done before. So rather than like having the the computer spit out a result where like oh yeah all the compsignathids come out in their own group, it's like no let's code these in a different way considering their ontogeny, considering that they might be juveniles, like, let's be thoughtful about that and use that to kind of frame our, our how we code the characters and then see if the results that we get make any more sense than the old results. So it's, it's uh, you know, a cladistic analysis. Gotcha. I guess, but it's yeah. it, is it advocating for using histology in the future i think so yeah yeah i don't i don't think andrea cow would be um you know opposed to that idea yeah so like um, getting collecting that's not what he does though. so he doesn't he doesn't like specialize in histology or anything that's not a method that um that he employs but mm -hmm. like he's trying to to kind of 
test the, the ontogeny hypothesis by means of cladistics instead, um, which is cool because, I don't know, I, I know in, in genetics, you know, there are cladistic analyses that, that geneticists do, and they're pretty cut and dry, I imagine, because, like, genes are already, you know, it, it's fairly black and white there. There's not a lot of subjectivity into how you code certain genes, right? Uh, unfortunately, yeah, there's a lot of nuance to really? that, too. Yeah, so actually, like, in wow. annotating a genome where you would think that it's pretty standard, where there is a a start site and an end site, uh -huh. even that isn't really standardized. Sometimes, like, people are going in manually, and for one of our ant species, it took someone five years to go wow. in and just annotate that genome because there were so many nuances to it, and, like, sequencing depth comes into play. Like, it is... It is not cut and dry. Like this is start site and end site. Wow. Yeah. Well, shoot. It, imagine if it were probably ten times as subjective, and that's kind of what we're dealing with. Sort <laughs> of paleontology, because it's like a single character state might be like, oh, well, the uh, the length of the fourth trochanter on the femur is, uh, you know, sixty percent. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of of kind of subjectivity there you know and trying to come up with with characters that are actually informative things that don't change as the animal grows something that's actually indicative of uh you know something that's, that's phylogenetically informative not something that varies through ontogeny or individual variation or taphonomy or allometry or whatever else um it's really difficult to come up with those character states um so that's why when you throw a juvenile animal into a, a tree where everybody else is an adult animal, like, it'll really mess up your result, potentially. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of, you know, the characters that you're putting in there might not be the result of phylogenetic differences. It's just ontogeny, you know? It's a neat system. It's a really neat system. Yeah. Like, I, again... I, I, I get, because I have to, why this would be not well-received... Uh-huh. But well, not... and I Yeah. There are there are definitely some like I don't know if I call them red flags, but yellow flags here maybe. Okay. It's a single authorship paper. Um and it's in a pretty obscure journal, I think. Um So what journal is this? Uh it's <laughs> yeah, an Italian it's... language journal. Um Bulletino de Societa Paleontologica Italiana. So it's like the bulletin of the Italian Paleontological Society. It's also um, an invited paper. Oh, okay. Right, so it... What, what does that say to you? So to me it means that the editor wanted to get a name into a journal. Uh -huh. And they basically offered the opportunity for someone to just write something. Sometimes it's on a topic... And other uh -huh. times it's just, we want you yeah. to almost give credibility, uh -huh. right, to our journal. So, for, I would love to have seen this, this, <laughs> uh, this paper get into, like, Proc B or, um, I don't know, something like that. Um, PNAS or something like that. Um, but, no, this is a really obscure journal, and apparently... I wonder if if the author shopped it around to different journals and just nobody was interested, or the the reviewers just, you know, said no each time. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the story behind this, um, but I wouldn't be shocked if that were the case. You know. How does I, I never know how one reviews these kinds of papers. Uh -huh. As well, like if you were a reviewer on this, this almost just sounds like a thought exercise. Right, it like kind of is, and it's it's interesting that he gets into like theory with this too, where it's like trying to build a framework for evaluating the phylogeny of theropod dinosaurs. It's a paper with high ambitions, and like uh, it, you would think it belongs in a higher tier journal than this. Um, but the thing is, I don't know if there's anybody in in dinosaur paleontology who's going to be primarily a splitter, like. Um, 
splitting species into different species because they look a little bit different. It's going to be, you know, cladists. It's going to be people who do cladistics, and that's their main focus. Um, and so, I don't know. It might be that, like, this is a, a uniquely poorly positioned paper to get into a big journal because everybody who's going to be reviewing this is a cladist. They do cladistics. And this is, a, a like, using cladistics to basically, like, try and lump different dinosaurs together, which is the opposite of what cladists are typically doing in this sort of a situation. So there could that be barriers sense. to the reviewers just because of what they believe. And so you're you're causing a mix basically for that reason. It's not that they wanted to... It's like they wouldn't be accepting it because it go against, goes against their norm. It's almost like some of those like new molecular works where all of a sudden it's this revolutionary idea and it's not what people like and therefore you're going to go against it because it disagrees with what you think is real I, not to make it seem like there's some sort of cabal of paleontologists who <laughs> uh, trying to gatekeep this or whatever but like you know it, it, there could be a little bit of politics in there for sure um, yeah yeah I, I'm really excited to be able to discuss this uh, at the end of October at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting. And before nice. that, with some of my colleagues in the field this summer, it's going to be really cool to be able to talk about this because, um, again, the, the methodology used in this paper goes right over my head. I am not a cladist. I, I don't work with cladistics, really. Um, and so I'm not well positioned to be able to evaluate the methodology, but the ideas in the paper and the... Uh, the kind of viewpoint really works well with how I'm used to thinking about these animals. And so it'll be cool to, to get the opinions of people who know more about the methodology than I do. Um, that makes sense. That's going to be cool. You're going to be able to go to both conferences this year, right? You'll be able to go to TwitchCon and uh, the Vertebrate Paleontology conference as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. Although TwitchCon this year is at the same time as some more field work that I could be doing otherwise. <laughs> it's always got to be something, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah. It's you know, it's it's hopefully making a big enough difference where there's going to be money coming in for the next year's field work, just like how last year there was that support as well. Yeah, yeah. Let's hope. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I should probably go pretty soon too, but like, I've not had dinner yet. I'm getting pretty hungry. Yes. So do Excuse we do me. we want to go ahead and uh, just wrap up this paper? Final thoughts. Um. Sure. Yeah, I. I don't want to rush you, but I think you know. It's really interesting. It, it yeah, it this paper, uh, it kind of, you know, to the extent that I have biases about this sort of thing, it's it's poking that in just the right way. Um, I uh, I really want this paper to to provoke a lot of discussion, and I. But yeah, so I I gotta I gotta check that. I've got to make sure that, that I'm not being uh, too credulous about this just because I like the idea. But, man, this, this drives really well with um, a lot of my own thinking on dinosaur ontogeny. And uh, it's cool that people are talking about it. I would love to see these ideas tested in a rigorous way through histology and, and stuff like that. Um, so let's hope that that happens. The the ontogeny battles debates continue, and I'm I'm really happy that this paper is out there, and I'm excited to discuss it with some colleagues. Nice, yeah, I I really enjoyed it. I really really enjoyed this paper. I thought it was a unique perspective, and it was cool. Again, just like this very first figure, kind of laying out the groundwork of how one would go about doing this. Yeah. And I thought it was just accessible. Like I, I, you know, I didn't feel like I needed to be an expert to to get the point across and like what exactly is the the protocol in which that you'll need to do in order to to be able yeah. to identify and do this. Yeah, and the the ramifications here are really intriguing as well. So if this guy is correct, compsognathids are not their own distinct group of dinosaurs. Um, they're just juveniles of of you know other groups that we already know about. Things like Shipionyx from uh, from Italy might be a juvenile Spinosaur, um, which is wild. That is not what you'd expect. Shipionyx is right here up on the wall. Uh, it's under the ichthyosaur. I know my picture's frozen right now. But a actually, uh, I did right get a, 
I did get a message now. It's apparently the, the stream together session has been corrupt. And so they suggest oh. they get maybe a restart of the session would unfreeze it. But Gotcha. Okay. So that's that's yeah. apparently uh I've never seen this error before, but that's a new error. So if we maybe we restarted it, it would be unfrozen, but you never know. Yeah, yeah. Well we might as well just wrap up then I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, I Yeah, I'm I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm pizza for dinner. I've been Oh nice. To is it. this a Lordy been, pizza? Uh, uh, this is a frozen pizza, a Safeway special, nice. or Red Baron probably. Ooh, okay, but, that's uh, a good one. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, um, this is true. But anyway, yeah, it, it could be the dinosaurs like Shipionix, Sinosauropteryx, Compsognathus. They're all just juveniles of dinosaur groups that we already know about, and that idea is really exciting to me, really interesting. Um, uh, it's something I've heard rumors about for a while, so I was thrilled to see this paper papers finally come out. I'm excited to talk about it with colleagues. It's uh, it's got the potential to change a lot of things, but uh, we'll see if it holds up. Do you suspect yeah. it'll be, given where it's published, it'll be widely talked about and accepted in terms? Oh, of... it's already being widely talked about. Okay, like the online for certain. Yeah, um, dinosaur paleontology is a small enough field that journal impact factor doesn't actually mean anything. Um, it's like if a paper is getting talked about, it's getting talked about regardless of where it's published. That's um, nice. So it means it's that just there's a prestige thing, basically. Like the the impact factor doesn't make an appreciable difference. I don't think. And um, yeah, I mean that at uh, least it's just a way to be hoity toity about stuff. I guess it at least suggests right that there is the the literature. People are in the field. They're up to date on the literature, right? It's like you kind of you're you're aware yeah. of what's going on versus. You know, if I publish on this gene that's in a niche journal, the lab that also works on that gene that publishes in a big journal is never going to see it. No, it's not like that at all. It's There's few enough papers. Um, it's like a few interesting papers every week, really, that okay. we're reading. And um, it's not like a you're not trying to drink from a fire hose. Like <laughs> gotcha. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, people are already talking about this, and uh, shoot, I would have been talking about it yesterday if the seminar hadn't been canceled at Berkeley. Uh, but I'll, I'm looking forward to discussing this with some colleagues at the uh, at the spring cookout for the Museum of Paleontology. That's going to be good. So, uh, nice. yeah, yeah, we in a few weeks. Awesome. Well, Danny, as we wrap up, I do want to highlight to people uh, the Amazon pinned wish list. Uh, just so that oh, folks you. can go check that out and contribute to it. And again, there is an email that I'll also link that you know people can send that they've indeed um, contributed. I mean, I, I'll grab that email as well. Uh, yeah, dinosaurcampaign at gmail.com. Yeah, Let's see, I have it. Yeah. I have it stored on our Discord because I always, always make sure to post it if people wanted to go check that out later as well. Um, nice. And then what have you got coming up, Danny, that you're really uh, excited about? Yeah, well, tomorrow on stream, we've got Thursday Birds Day, as always, but we'll also be celebrating the uh, life and legacy of Zofia kielin who is a, a Polish paleontologist. Uh, she organized these expeditions. They were joint uh, Polish-Mongolian expeditions in the 1960s or 70s. Um, she, her team discovered the famous fighting dinosaurs, the Velociraptor and Protoceratops, locked in Mortal Kombat. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll be talking about that too. Um, and then I think Friday is World Tapir Day. Um, and so we'll be talking about those cool mammals with their little proboscis, their little snoots. Um, tapirs are, are related to horses and rhinos, and uh, they're really cool critters. We'll be talking Not about anteaters. That. Not anti not anywhere close to anteaters. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me make sure it is World Tapir Day. I'm gonna look at my schedule real quick. Um, yep, bingo. The twenty sixth, World Tapir Day. Nice. So that'll be uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Cool, yeah. guys. Make sure to please follow Danny and thank him for doing these crossovers with us. They're definitely a highlight of my week, and I always learn a bunch. And thank y'all for always coming, asking questions, and please, if you're not already following Danny, single greatest science communicator on Twitch. The YouTubes and more. Um, and truly, like, Danny, science would not be here without you. So thank you. Science and science on the platform. So thank you for everything that you do for not just us here, but the entire community of being a leader. And we 
I cannot tell you how much we appreciate it. Cool, and I really appreciate you saying that. Thank you for everything you do as the, this huge cheerleader for the community, giving us this legitimacy. You and Lita, PhD researchers here on Twitch, it's that's a big deal. And thank you for once again opening up your channel and your community to, to have me on today. And looking forward to doing this again next Wednesday. It's our absolute pleasure, Danny. And um, chat again make sure check out the wish list bookmark the wish list page follow danny get your images ready for thursday birds day for tomorrow and uh yeah danny i'll i'll see you tomorrow my friend i'm always there <laughs> sounds good Blaine. i look forward to it thank you danny enjoy the we'll pizza you thank you take care goodbye All right, y'all. That was the lovely Professor Danny Anduza of Paleontology.